Hello, and welcome to the second seminar in the series Plebs, Common Goods and Alternatives to Capitalism. My name is uh, Katarzyna Czaczot, and I am the co-curator of this series together with Łukasz Moll and Michał Pospieszel. Today's lecture concerns the feminist perspective on the commons. But before I introduce our guests, I would like to make a short and formal announcement. And it goes as follows. After the lecture, we are planning a discussion which will be streamed on our Facebook and YouTube channels, as well as recorded and archived on YouTube and in resources on our website. If you don't consent to making your image public, we ask you to keep your camera and microphone off throughout the entire event. You can send your questions on the chat. Leaving your camera and microphone on will be considered as permission to use your image impliedly. We encourage everyone to join the discussion. So that was the announcement. And now I can introduce our guest, who is Professor Silvia Federici. Silvia Federici is a feminist activist and a renowned political theorist. In uh, 1972, she co-founded the International Feminist Collective, which launched the famous Wages for Housework campaign. Her groundbreaking uh, 2004 book, which uh, hopefully uh, will come out uh, this year in Polish translation. The book is entitled Caliban and the Witch, Women, the Body and Primitive Accumulation, concerns the witch hunting in the context of the enclosure of common land and the rise of capitalism, the system that imposes on women the reproduction of workforce. Reproductive labor understood very widely as all activities but by which our life is reconstituted is the central threat in Federici's work. It is discussed among others in 2012 book, uh, Revolution at Point Zero, but also in Reenchanting the Word, which was published in 2018. Arguing for the significance of women's unpaid labor in the process of capitalist accumulation, Federici demonstrates how the sphere of reproduction becomes now the key terrain of anti-capitalist struggle. One of the most crucial challenges involved in this uh, struggle is the construction of new commons. Silvia Federici has taught at several universities in the US and also at the University of Port Harcourt in Nigeria. She's now a Merita Professor at Hofstra University in Hampstead, New York. Uh, Sylvia, welcome. And thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation. And um, the, floor, uh, the floor is yours. I made it. <laughs> uh, Good, good afternoon, good afternoon or good evening to all. I'm sorry for the, the wait, but I'm not very technologically inclined and uh, I was not fast enough to, to, to reach you. So good evening, welcome. I'm very happy to be with you. And I think the topic that we are going to discuss tonight is very, very appropriate because there is no question in my mind that uh, the destruction that has been caused by the COVID pandemic is to a great extent you know, caused by a political crisis and uh, a crisis of the commons. Certainly uh, the mortality, the deadly effects of these pandemics can really be traced to the constant dismantling now for decades, you know, the whole period and the whole uh, program of neoliberal, the neoliberal phase of capitalism has been a constant assault on the social commons. And I refer here to healthcare system, public healthcare system, public service system, pension system, as well an assault on uh, what some call the natural commons, which are not natural uh, anymore. Um, forests, waters, croplands, 
you know, it is very clear that, uh, for instance, you know, one of the causes of mortality due to the epidemic is uh, really to be related to the fact that our immunity systems have been undermined by the fact that the food we ingest, the air we breathe, the water we drink, right, are all constantly subject to contamination by a great variety of pesticides and, um, you know, deadly chemicals. So the issue of the commons uh, is uh, very much at the center, you know, of, uh, you know, some of the main problematics uh, that uh, we are dealing with today. And I think here that a feminist perspective is crucial because a feminist perspective, and of course, uh, it's important here to keep in mind that uh, today we have many types of feminism. And when I speak of feminist, I do not refer to the neoliberal feminism that uh, is concerned with women equal share, you know, in uh, the so-called benefit of capitalist society. So I'm not interested in the question of uh, equal sharing uh, in a society that is not to be changed, but I'm speaking of a feminism whose revolutionary contribution has been to bring to the question of social transformation, you know, the issue of reproduction. You know, the question of reproduction, the, the exploitation of a whole world of reproductive activity and a whole world of social subjects that has been either ignored or marginalized by the traditional socialist movement, communist movement. And, uh, you know, the issue of reproduction, of course, reproduction has um, very, very many aspects to it, you know, from child raising, procreation, child raising, uh, domestic work, but also the whole question of the care of the environment. And so I think that today and the feminist perspective is particularly important because in a way it helps us to put the spotlight right, to the fact that this society in which we live, this capitalist system is not really guaranteeing our reproduction. That this capitalist system it's continuously undermining, you know, our, the possibility of our reproduction. And uh, uh, there is uh, often a reference to the fact that, uh, you know, those who are most affected by COVID, you know, are people who have pre-existing condition. Well, I think it's important to say that capitalism is a pre-existing condition. You know, the logic of a system where continuously, continuously the life of human being is subordinated, is subordinated to the logic of the accumulation of private wealth. This is the pre-existing condition that in a way shapes, you know, uh, shapes all social relation and, you know, the, our vulnerability also to, to the, the effect of, of these uh, very deadly forms of production. And uh, in the United States, for instance, we have seen the pre-existing condition of the, for the mortality, uh, uh, the effect of COVID has been uh, social inequality. You know, those who have been most exposed and have been most likely, you know, to die of uh, the COVID have been black people, migrant people, you know, people who have been uh, institutionally discriminated, institutionally marginalized, and, um, and who are living in the most unhealthy part of uh, the town or of the country, and whose areas are continuously under assault, you know, by all kinds of, you know, racist form of uh, treatment of the environment. So, this is a this is a, is a the context you know for the, my discussion of the question of the commons. I think that today to think of the commons, to think of the commons, and to think it from a feminist viewpoint, you know, commons both 
as a principle of organization of society, as a general principle of organization of society. This is first and foremost, right? A principle of organization of society that has uh, Massimo De Angelis in his very beautiful book, powerful, Omnia Sum Communion, everything is in common or everything should be in common. Uh, you know, he has argued uh, strongly that the principle of the common is a principle that should be considered equivalent, although the opposite of the capitalist principle, you know, which is a principle of enclosure, principle of privatization, principle of exploitation of labor and so forth. So the commons first as a principle of social organization and also the commons right, as actually social wealth, social and natural wealth, the product of our work, you know, to be shared. And it's a principle that implies, you know, the, the possibility of building a society, you know, where we have equal access, equal sharing to, to the means of our production, to the wealth of nature, and where we work in cooperation rather than competition, and where you know we uh, have responsibility, you know, for them. We are not motivated by self-interest, but the principle of cooperation. And we have institution of collective decision making. In fact, this is a very key element of the commons. Is not only the wealth to be shared and the principle of sharing but the principle of collective decision-making, um, and uh, which means that, uh, you know, the possibility of creating society built on self-government. And so uh, why I became interested in the question of the commons? I became interested, first of all, because by the 19, early 1980s, it became clear that, uh, with the new expansion of capitalist relation uh, that has gone under the name of globalization or has gone under the name of the new neoliberal forms of capitalism, right? There was a new renewed assault, you know, on, on the last remaining form of, of communalism on this planet. And then this was very important, very, very, enlightening in a way, because we began to realize that in fact, as in the 16th, 17th century, today as well, uh, capitalism cannot perpetuate itself, cannot exist, cannot expand, cannot perpetuate itself, unless it continuously, periodically dispossesses large population, large number of people from their land, from their acquired rights, from their, you know, uh, communities, and throws them once again onto the labor market, even though many of them will never find any form of employment. In fact, what we have seen as a result of this new enclosure, this new destruction of the commons, which now are global, from Africa to Latin America, Asia, you know, and they are responsible, of course, for the big, big migratory movements, right? What we have seen has not been a growth of wage labor, but actually a growth of informal work, informal labor, people who work outside of the social contract of the wage. So the, the uh, dispossession, expropriation, enclosure, has gone hand in hand also with a process of mass impoverishment, mass migration, mass impoverishment. So the destruction of the commons, of course, has also generated a worldwide uh, resistance, which continues to this day. I mean, right now, as I'm speaking, there is incredible struggles that are taking place, urban struggle and struggle also, you know, in, 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 in the fishery, in, in the forest, for example, in the Amazonia, there is a tremendous amount of struggle by people who, you know, Bolsonaro is trying to expel from their territory, from their ancestral territory. So we have come to realize actually the capitalism throughout its history, you know, the what that the socialist Marxist historian have called the process of primitive accumulation, 
is not being, is never being something only at the beginning of capitalist society. You know, when Marx speaks of the transition, the period that sets the condition for the expansion of capitalist society. Well, the condition of existence to capitalism have to be constantly renewed, constantly renewed, which means that expropriation, dispossession is a constant element of uh, you know, capitalist relation throughout the, the, the end, until the end will be of, of capitalism, right? And um, this resistance, this struggle, beginning the struggle of the Zapatista, the struggle of the movement, uh, the landless people of Brazil and many, many others have been, of course, very, very crucial. Uh, but uh, I've also been inspired very early you know, by the, the feminist, the feminist contribution to the discussion of the commons. And I'm referring here to people like uh, Vandana Shiva, Maria Mies, Patrick in accumulation on a large scale. And also uh, I had been working, you know, on, on the history, you know, on the history of primitive accumulation, writing in researching, um, you know, the history they went into Caliban and the witch. And uh, the, the argument of Vandana Shiva, the Vandana Shiva makes particularly in books like Staying Alive, Staying Alive resonated with me. And the argument is that, um, you know, it has been women in particular who have had a great interest in the defense of the commons that women through the history of capitalism have been more interested even than men in defending the commons. Because throughout the history of capitalism, women have had a much more tenuous relation to the monetary economy. For instance, they have been excluded from many forms of waged work and uh, be made dependent on men for their survival. And so for women to have access to, for example, being able to have access to fields, to forests, to, to a form of social commons and, and natural commons has been particularly important. And because of it, women have been in the forefront of the struggle you know, in the defense and reconstruction of the commons. And uh, this resonated, of course, with me because this is what I have found, you know, when I was researching uh, Caliban and the witch, and I was looking at the great rebellion of the 17th, 16th century, and also at the day-to-day -day struggle. There were rebellions in England, you know, when uh, to, take off the fences from the common land, you know, which were used to enclose. But there was also a micro war that was led by women with their children. And um, they were very often, these were women who were accused of witchcraft or they were subjected to very cruel punishment, but they were in the forefront of the struggle. So this question of women and the commons was very, very important. And by the time I began to work on this, uh, which was sometimes in the late 80s, uh, I began to realize that the discourse of the common was uh, in a way polarized uh, at that time. And uh, you had a discourse like uh, the one about uh, the destruction of the land commons, you know, the dispossession of many people. For example, you know, in uh, the, American, the American continent, NAFTA, the North American the Free Trade Agreement, you know, dispossessed a lot of campesinos, a lot of peasants in Mexico from their land and, and uh, triggered a big migration into the United States, you know, by people who could not any longer live by doing agricultural work, you know. And, uh, but I realized that there was a lot of discussion of expropriation from the land. And on the other side, there was a discussion now of the internet, 
For example, Italian autonomists like Mike, like Antonio Negri, who was collaborating with Michael Hall, you know, were beginning to develop a theory of the internet as a sort of a common, right? I have big problems with that because uh, the internet relies on a technology which is very destructive of the natural environment. You know, all the minerals that are necessary for computers or for iPhone, they are coming from uh, the destruction of lands in Africa and Latin America. To make a computer, you have to sift millions of tons of land. You have to sift through soil to extract the mineral. You need a lot of water, pure water. So actually the technology that presumably creates more communal forms of communication. It's a technology that depends on the destruction. And I think that this is one of the issues that we have to confront. I think this is one of the issues that the left has to put at the center because we cannot ignore you know, what are the consequences of the technologies that we use and on what it is based and not problematize it as a central, central issue, which it is, you know? particularly as a time in which uh, the, the attack on, on the lands in Africa and Latin America is, is massive. It's really massive. Um, so uh, at the time I saw that there was uh, the, the commons were talked about on one side as land commons, and then you had, you know, the, the internet commons, the digital commons. And um, my interest has been, you know, and still is how the principle of the common, how this reorganization of life, you know, in a more collective, in a more communal way, you know, can apply to the question of the daily reproduction. Reproduction, not only in the sense of agriculture, subsistence agriculture, but in the sense of domestic work, child raising, procreation. And this is part of the work that I've been doing, like the commoning of reproductive activities, the commoning of reproductive activity. Now, why, what does it mean? Uh, it, first of all, I think it's extremely important because uh, uh, one, of the, one of the great powers, one of the great powers of capitalism, right, has been uh, not only the power to expropriate people, you know, but also the power to divide, divide us, create hierarchies, isolate us from each other, isolate us from each other. The nuclear family, the creation of a nuclear family, the organization of reproductive work, of reproductive activities, you know, in a way that completely fragments, isolates, separates people. You know, uh, Leopoldo Fortunati in, uh, in an important book called The Arcane of Reproduction has spoken about the fact that capitalism, you know, and here Marx has made a lot of it, concentrate people in the factory, brings together people in the factory. This is less and less true, by the way because they have discovered it to bring people in the factories to also to create you know, the potential for a tremendous amount of, of uh, struggle. But says Fortunati, uh, it disintegrates, separates, isolates people in the reproduction of labor power, right? So it would be too explosive. It would be too explosive to allow, for instance, the same people are brought together in the factory, in the wage workplace to allow them to also have communal concentration, uh, communal form of living in, in, uh, in, in the community, I mean, uh, in the reproductive sphere, right? So more and more, you know, the principle of capitalism has been to separate us, isolate us. If you come to the United States and you look at the suburbs, right, at what was created after World War II. After World War II, at the time when, um, you know, there was a sense of crisis in, in the United States, 
because all these men were coming back from the war. They were all coming back from the war. They had uh, lived close to each other and uh, for, uh, for the years, and uh, they had developed solidarity for each other. Uh, they thought that they were fighting for democracy. They were fighting against the fascists. They were fighting for democracy. And, uh, and they know about fighting. They had had a lot of knowledge and training about struggle. So they were very worried. And in fact, when the GIs with the American soldier came back, the United States was very generous with many of them, mostly those whites, uh, gave them the possibility to go to school and build these little suburbs, right? Making it possible for them each to buy a house each to buy a house, but in a way they would completely isolate one family from the other, you know? And they studied every detail of those houses. So the man would have his workroom. So if he had extra time, he would spend it in his workroom, fixing things. So he wouldn't have to go to a, labor, to a meeting. The women had the ironing room. They even built a little garden in front of the house so that the men on Sunday could mourn the lawn. And they all do, I mean, the many of them, a uh, little garden. All of this to enclose. So we have to think of enclosure, not only as enclosure of land, but also as enclosure of social relation. The nuclear family is a form of enclosure. Is it, they have not, put fences around it. But when you look at the suburb, you can actually think, and of course, we're not speaking only of the suburb. The whole idea of the private, the private life. There's nothing private about reproduction. There's nothing private about the family. Women know that very well because our own bodies, our own sexuality, the, the way in which procreate, the whole the control that we have or do not have over our reproduction, it's been regulated tightly by the state and then also delegated to men to supervise that we behave properly. Uh, so there's nothing private. You know, one of the great contributions of the feminist movement has been to find and assert that the so-called private is public. The personal is political. Sexuality is a terrain of power relation. Sexuality is a terrain of an equal power relation. You know? So all of this is extremely important because we have to expand the notion of the common. We have to expand to see the capitalism as try to disintegrate you know, ways in which we can become, come together and build our strength because the common is a principle of collective strength. And this is why I think today is so important. You know, the, the idea that capitalism has uh, fomented of individualism, the self-made man, the self-made man is, is a myth, right? As uh, Marx has so eloquently demonstrated, there is no self-made capitalist. Capitalism has been built on violence and the expropriation of entire population. And uh, for the person, for the proletarian, the working class person who doesn't have any property, right? Um, the, the, the principle of self-made and individualism is a principle of impoverishment. It's a principle of uh, uh, vulnerability because you are alone, facing the system alone, facing the crisis alone. Now, back to the question of the common and a feminist perspective on the common. You know, what, um, as I was uh, becoming very interested in thinking how we could communalize reproductive activity, how we could come. Uh, engage in a process of commoning of our reproduction. Uh, I began to be familiarize myself more with the uh, transformation that were already taking place in this way uh, throughout Latin America. 
uh, Chile, Argentina, Chile after the coup, the Pinochet coup in 1973, Argentina 2000, 2001, when the monetary economy collapsed, the monetary economy collapsed, you couldn't even go to the bank, nothing. And then women began to bring, you know, these big pots of beans and rice to the street, you know, the piqueteras, you know, and uh, as uh, some women writers have put it, a whole new economy became visible. When the monetary economy collapsed, another economy, the real economy, the economy that kept people alive, that allowed people to come together and survive, despite the fact that they did not have money available to them, right? So what I began to see studying this history and studying in particular, you know, how in the face of major massive economic and political crisis, like the Pinochet coup, you know, where you have, first of all, the most brutal repression, people disappearing, 30,000 people arrested, massacred, and at the same time, a brutal economic program, the first structural adjustment program, massive devaluation, uh, massive um, impoverishment, closing down of every production outfit, et cetera, et cetera. So there you have a imposition of a neoliberal austerity program. At the same time that you have a campaign of state terror, right? What began to change the situation was women, women going out with their children, protected by the fact that they had the children and somehow the police and the army, you know, realized they could not attack these women and they began to go shopping together. They began to cook together, bring the pots, them to, to the streets and uh, to be able to put together their resources, right? And in that way also circulate information, circulate knowledge about what was taking place, gain some confidence, begin to break the terror, the fear that was paralyzing so many people, you know? And the same situation that I, I mentioned also in Argentina, you know, the coming together, you know, it's not only a way of providing for survival, for the material survival, food, et cetera, but it's also knowledge, it's also uh, creating different type of type and so on. And over the years, I've been uh, more and more uh, aware that uh, because of the massive attack that has been taking place in Africa and across the world, in the global south in particular, but not only in the global south, you know, we have the same in the United States, you know, thousands and thousands of homeless people, the massive increase in rent, you know, the dismantling of entire community connected with certain industries, people sleeping in the streets, the, you know, uh, investment in daycare, investment in centers for the senior, all have been undermined. And so we see the same processes. And, but in response to that, you know, especially in Latin America, and I think it is because in Latin America, we have an indigenous communitarian tradition that has remained more strong. You still have communal regime in Guatemala, in Mexico. We have territories in which people are still uh, organized, you know, um, not around private property, you know, and these still survive today under the soul. Because of that, when people have been forced to go to the cities, they have brought with them that kind of communalism. They have brought with them 
And the women in particular, they have begun in front of the crisis to set up collective kitchen, to set up collective places in the community, to give first assistance so you don't have to go to the hospital immediately all the time, particularly if you don't have money, that's out of bounds. Uh, communal gardens, uh, communal committees to provide a glass of milk to children. In other words, a whole process of, uh, you know, communization of the, the reproduction of the community. And uh, observing that, learning from that, discussing with the women, uh, I learned something very, very, very important that which is that what these activities what these new forms of organization are producing again is not just you know better survival better forms of survival they are also producing a new political situation because that act in a way of creating communal structure right uh, is a process of empowerment it's a process whereby you create a new type of social fabric. You, know, you strengthen the social solidarity and you enable the community to confront the state from a position of power. So that discourse is not you know, the question of replacing the state. Ideally, one day we'll replace the state. One day we'll all live in a society in which uh, we don't have this structure, this structure of the monopolizes the wealth, monopolizes the violence ahead of us, on top of us. You know, we'll have a society of, uh, you know, individuals and, and groups that are self-governed. But already now, the principle of the commons is not a replacement of the state because we cannot replace the state. We don't have the means. The state holds the social wealth in its hands, but gives us much more power to negotiate, to fight with the state, right? The power, that we, what we can obtain or impose on the state depends on the power from below. So the struggle, it seems to me, has to be on two fronts at the same time. Two fronts on the same time. One front, of course, is with the state, the corporation, capital. But on the other side, and even more fundamental, is the destruction of reproduction in a way that does not divide us, in a way that does not weaken us, isolate us, but give us much more power. And, uh, you know, it, I have been thinking about the, you know, I have many ways in which now I express this idea, which is, you know, less and less, you know, reproductive work to reproduce the workforce for exploitation. Less and less of reproductive work to send people to the factories, send them to, and more and more reproduction for the struggle more and more a reproduction that gives people more strength, more confidence, more resources, you know, for the struggle that we need to make. And uh, again, turning the community from communities that are social factories, the social factory where labor power is reproduced, and communities that are communities of resistance. You know, we began to speak also years ago with a lot of young people with whom we were brainstorming about the commons, the commons, and uh, we started thinking about self-reproducing movement, you know, movement that the commons are important, you know, to keep our movement alive. And we have seen now in the United States, you know, in response to COVID, a very powerful response coming from different and in the name of mutual aid, in the name of mutual aid, which means in front of the crisis, in front of the crisis, people immediately know that you do not confront the crisis in isolation. 
You cannot confront the crisis in isolation. In front of the crisis, the first response is to come together. Now, the issue is, the challenge is how we transform this emergency response, this emergency response into a structures that are permanent. Structures that are permanent. What do we need to create? You know, I mentioned some of the examples from Latin America. These are very powerful to me, the communal kitchen. It's quite an experience to walk into a big room where you see 10 people, women, but young men too, cooking together once a week. Not all week, once a week, making a thousand meals. And those meals you cook for the whole community. And then next day is another, etc. All the garden. The, print, the, the, the experience of the communal garden in the United States has been very powerful because the gardens have become a means not only to produce zucchini, but to produce solidarity, to produce social relation, cultural exchange, people in the community coming from Africa, coming from Latin America, talking to each other, plotting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All the men coming together in a communal garden, playing card, discussing. So this is the spirit of the common. And uh, as I said, we have to think of it both in terms of specific reality, social reality, but also as a broad principle. And I think that this is another challenge. You know, Marx argues that uh, when he was asked about what is communism, communism is not some uh, dream to be built in a ever distant future, but is the act that by day by day changes the status quo, right? And I would say the commons is the same. The commons is the same. The commons is a principle that is not to be postponed to a future post-capitalist society, but the common is realized today in the form we organize in the social movement, in the way we organize our reproduction, in the way we relate to each other, in the affective ties that we construct and how we see the struggle, not as something abstract, but something that transforms our life immediately, starting from today, starting from the, the present, creating in so many micro and macro way, you know, ways in which structure that bring us together, in which we can begin to put our life together, to join our life and to think of our happiness, not in individual terms, but in collective terms. And one interesting development that I see already happening here, you know, the United States is a monster place, at the same time has the benefit of receiving many migrants. And because we have so many immigrant people, particularly from Latin America, who are bringing here the whole experience of what remain of the indigenous, of the indigenous culture, of the indigenous structure of value, which is very communal, right? This has begun to filter, you know, in our own social movement too, not enough, but it's happening. For instance, in New York, these days we have assemblies, you know, the principle of the neighborhood assembly, you know, which is the principle of collective decision making, collective decision making. You know, um, I work with the women's group. We are now having assembly by Zoom uh, to discuss with women across the country to discuss March 8, you know, what do we mean by calling for a women's strike? you know, for the March 8. And uh, so this to me is the comedy. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, in conclusion, I would say the principle of the comedy in a way enables us also to go beyond the old debate, uh, you know, leftist uh, socialist debate about reform and revolution, right? Because, uh, Obviously, we, we cannot think of revolution as this one day event, you know, it's like a volcano erupting. No, it's not going to be like that. It's going to be built through a long process of transformation. 
And in the process of transformation, you know, the question of building communal relation. And through that empowerment, a word that I don't really like because it's so being misused, but let's use it in this mo moment. Change forced the state to implement certain reforms. And here we have to be very, 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 I think the issue of reform is the key issue because we have to be very careful. There are reforms that divide us. There are reforms that uh, put an end to the struggle because they pacify, they satisfy the needs of one sector and uh, leave the others, you know, to, 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 to with nothing, right? So there are reforms that actually seem to respond to the struggle, but only in a way that divides it. There are other reforms that are lifting the bottom. They are giving more power to all. And I think this is the kind of reform that we have to have. And so we cannot speak of revolution versus reform. It's what kind of reform? And I think reforms that are strengthening the common, they have a common in principle within it, is what we should struggle. And I think that this is beginning to happen. There is a new feminism that is growing popular feminism, grassroots feminism, that uh, is committed to the idea of the commons, committed to the idea of placing life at the center, who is not interested in sharing equally exploitation with men, is not equaling in equal shares in an unjust society, but is interested you know, in subverting a system of reproduction a system of reproduction that reproduces us as slaves, reproduces us as people to be exploited, as labor power, or, or as homeless, vagabonds, you know, migrants to die in the Mediterranean, and so forth. And uh, I think this is new grassroots feminism, right, that uh, is not concerned just with women's issues is not concerned with sectorial limited issues, but is concerned with bringing a different perspective on the whole, on the question of work, on the question of class, on the question of capitalism, on the question of revolution. I think that that is extremely important. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I would like to encourage the participants of our ser uh, seminar to ask, uh, ask the question. Uh, let me have a look at the chat. Perhaps there are some already. I'm sorry, I took so much time. I didn't realize I was taking so much time. No, but thank you so much. I mean, what I love about your vision uh, of commoning is that it is, um, it sounds very utopian, but it's not utopian. I mean, as you said it, we can have it just like that uh, by commoning the garden with our neighbors. So it's a, it's a really fascinating, fascinating vision. Uh, okay, what I would like to ask is, um, uh, is the question uh, that is, I think that is really important for all your books because you write about uh, about the liberation of, from capitalist exploitation. And at the same time, uh, your book, I mean, Reenchanting the World, but also I think the Revolution of Point Zero is kind of uh, different from the leftist emancipation projects. And um, I would see this difference that while, uh, while those projects um, uh, while those proje projects stress cutting ties, uh, striving for independence, you propose strengthening uh, the ties, mm. that is your connection to the nature, cosmos, the land, but also building right. stronger relationships with other people by uh, sharing and cooperating. And uh, what I'd like to ask is, um, to what extent your project of a collective subject might be seen as an attempt to transvalue the concept of freedom, the concept that has played a, a, a crucial role, that uh, the crucial role in all emancipatory movements. Yeah, um, it, it's not the way of transvaluing freedom, but you know, the question is, is always freedom for what? 
Right? Freedom for what? Freedom to kill you and then have impunity like uh, the cops in the United States. They are very free. They kill people and none of them has ever gone to jail for it. That's one type of freedom, right? So I think uh, the freedom that we are talking about is, uh, you know, freedom from what? And freedom does not, it's, it's, a, it's a concept that speaks from a point of view of liberating ourselves from something. Right, but doesn't tell us, right? What what uh, what the entitlement that we have? It does not speak to our material condition. It does not speak to our reciprocal relation, right? So in a way, it's a it's a concept that is very limited, and is limited to situation in which you already assume that there is a, a system of oppression in place. So it's not transvaluing freedom, but uh, we need to, you know, add, go beyond also freedom, expand on what the freedom is based upon, right? It doesn't say what the freedom is based upon and moreover, what is freedom for? To do what? Because you can be free to be very destructive. So we have to be much more specific you know, in our projects. Okay, thank you. Um, well, when I was when I was uh, saying about those strengthening the ties with uh, with the nature, I kind of refer to this uh, concept of uh, reenchanting that you used in your book from two thousand eighteen. Yeah, and um, as far as I I can remember, you write that it's not about religious reenchanting, but it's more like political and reenchanting. Yeah. Could you please elaborate more on uh, on that? Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. You know, and uh, the question of the enchantment is uh, basically to overcome, you know, a, a situation in which we look at other people or the natural world or animal lie only as subject, object of exploitation, lie only as uh, marketable entities and uh, to recuperate the sense, you know, the nature we are dealing with living organism. You know, they have, uh, you know, a whole creativity, a principle of creativity. Same with animal. I think uh, in capitalism, we have, uh, experience such a dramatic degradation of animals. If we were aware, for instance, the way animals are treated and the, what happens to an animal before it reaches, for example, you know, uh, before it reaches our tables and uh, the way they are tortured. And so we need to re-understand, recreate, you know, the relationship with the animal world. And this is what I mean by the enchantment. You know, the enchantment is a process whereby we change, transform, revolutionize our relationship with other people in the world. And the, in a way that looks at them as, uh, you know, possessing the same creativity as living organisms. And uh, that is the enchantment. Okay. And would you say that there's a, there is a chance when you say about living organism that there is a chance to reclaim the notion of life from uh, pro-lifers activists? No, I don't think the, the pro-life left on, they're not interested in life. Okay. These, these people are not interested in life. I tell you something, it's the biggest hypocrisy because it's the same thing with the church. Once, once the fetus becomes a child, once it exits from the mother's womb, they don't care. And if, if we struggle to, to ask for some support money, they will be the first to oppose it. These are right-wing people who have opposed systematically any form of welfare benefit to women with young children. So this is very hypocritical that they care for life. Mm -hmm. They care for life as long as their life is in the womb of the, is in the womb of a woman. Once it exits and calls for some for some help, some some support, they are they don't know. They disappear. 
you know, same thing with the Vatican, same thing with the church and the popes. The, the Vatican is immensely rich. It's immensely rich, right? And they preach poor women that they have to have children. Have you ever seen the Vatican sending a check to the women who had children because they denied, you know, the right to contraceptive? No. So I don't want to hear by these people who talk about the right to life and the sacredness of life. The sacredness of life is demonstrated by, by facts, by program, by support, not by this kind of project. Um. Okay, I, I, I want to ask our participants if they, uh, if they have any questions. Uh, I think that you are, uh, you are not only... Okay, here's, uh, here's the question. Michael, should I read it or you want to read it aloud? Okay, so I will read it. But perhaps Sylvia, you also see this question because it's um, uh, right now it's on the chat. Okay. Historically, for example, in England, enclosure and dispossession were mainly resisted through class-based struggles. In its modern form, resistance appears to be primarily identity-based. Is there a reason for that? Uh, maybe the person who is asking the question can tell me because I'm not sure that uh, in modern form resistance appears to be primarily identity based. Uh, what, you know, it because it's women, then it's that there's identity. So maybe I will respond about my, my, you know, number one, the question of identity. What is identity, right? I think there's a lot of confusion about the notion of identity, you know? Uh, when, um, the Kumbahi River Collective in 1974, this was a black women's group, right? For the first time introduced the notion of identity politics in 1974. What they meant is not what many people think. They meant identity. Identity to them meant a particular history. When they talked about black identity, that identity meant recognizing a particular historical place, you know? They did not divorce the idea of identity, blackness as such. To so them, blackness meant a particular form of exploitation, had a material basis, a particular history, the history of slavery. So when we speak of identities, identities relate in the deepest sense to places in the capitalist organization of work. So when it's properly understood, identity is not separated from class. The moment you separate identity from class, from exploitation, you know, from a particular organization of work, then I think you have problems, right? So we have always spoken of women or non-conforming subject, not from a point of view of an abstract identity, but from the point of view of particular forms of exploitation. That's why we speak of a gender-based or sexual-based division of labor, the sexual division of labor. So that if you are a woman, and we don't mean all women, no, women who control capital, or no, it's, they, these are not, but women in the history of capitalism has meant a particular set of tasks. Is meant confinement to the production, is meant not to be able to have access to particular forms of work, is meant to be excluded from higher education, is meant until the 19th century in many parts of Europe not to have a legal identity. Remember, there was the system in England and in France into the 19th century of the femme couvert. Femme couvert meant the women did not have a legal identity. This is what we are talking about. Women did not have a legal identity. If they had a court case, a man had to represent them. They didn't have right to their wages. You know, I have a polemics with Marx. Marx has a conception of 
the expropriated worker, the expropriated peasant becomes a wage worker. The expropriated peasant goes to the market and sells his labor power. Women did not enter capitalism as owners of their labor power. Unlike men, they did not enter capitalism as owner. Even actually, even men did not enter capitalism as owner uh, because in the first phase, as Yang Mulye Butang as well demonstrated, in the first phase, wage labor was imposed, was a form of forced labor, right? So the image of the free worker who goes to the market, sells himself for that, actually is a, is a figure that begins to become real in the 18th century, after the long system of struggle. But women way beyond the 18th century were not in control of their labor power, right? I think this is very important. This history is very important. So when we speak of identity, we have to keep in mind that we cannot separate it from its material basis. And so, yeah, identity, a minor is an identity, right? That means a particular form of work, a particular place in the organization of labor and uh, in, in a particular set of social relations. Mm -hmm. Today is often used in a different way, but this is not, you know, the way it should be understood. So there's no conflict between identity, the use of identity and class. Thank you. Well, uh, there shouldn't be, there shouldn't be. Okay, there's a question from, uh, from Mina Pibaginova, um, which I suppose I should read. Uh, Thank you for your talk. I spent several years in Latin America and therefore I can very much relate to what you have discussed. Considering your contexts are very much rooted in Latin American context, could you try to elaborate how we can understand, oh, sorry, these, um, these concepts in post-socialist countries, considering the brutal neoliberal neo transition we have experienced in the region of East Central Europe? Yeah, I think uh, one reason why people began, up. Uh, one reason people began to speak of the commons also was the crisis of, uh, you know, realized uh, socialism, right? The, the fall of the Berlin Wall put clearly demonstrated all the limits and all the crises of, uh, of communism as it had been realized. And uh, in that sense, the question of the commons has become more prominent also because of the vacuum in the revolutionary imagination, right? Because you couldn't think of a future of a non-capitalist society, of an anti-capitalist process from the point of view of communism. You know, too much, the Stalinist past has been too, too much. And that, uh, you know, and not only the Stalinist path, but a certain conception, right, of revolution, so deeply connected with the development of technology, so that, uh, and developmentalism, mm, there's been a developmentalism that has been central to the project of the socialist left, communist left. And so the commons, has been a move away from that, has been to reclaim that conception, you know, of uh, anti-capitalism that in a way emerged in the 16th, 17th century in the struggle of the diggers, you know, the conspiracy of the equal, Babeuf, et cetera, et cetera, you know, which basically says, you know, the earth belongs to all, right? The earth belongs to all. You know, everything should be in common, right? And uh, the idea of self-government, 
of self-government societies, the rejection of the idea of competition. I think that these are crucial as much in Europe, in the United States, as they are in Latin America. The only difference in Latin America is that communal system have never been completely destroyed. The people have fought and, uh, and uh, still communalism has survived. You know? uh, but these principles are as important. You know? It's the whole question, what are we struggling for? Right? What is the problem with capitalism? Today we see it. We see that millions and millions have been stripped of everything. Now I heard that a hundred more people have died just the last two days trying to cross the Mediterranean from Africa. And the latest figure is that 17,000 people in the last 10, 15 years, 17,000, mostly young people, young black guys, black women, African women, children have drowned trying to escape, you know, society, communities that have been so impoverished. They have no hope for the future and they're willing to risk dying. The same with Latin America coming to the border with the United States. People live knowing that uh, the trip may be their death, but already the condition at home have been created. What kind of world is this? What kind of world is this? So we need to change this world. And what are the principles we take with us in the process of changing this world? It seems to me that the principle of social solidarity, you know, and that's what the commons is. You know, not about because we create a, you know, a communal daycare center, but as a way of approaching right, our concept of social relation, our concept of how, and then the challenge is to find the concrete ways in which we translate that principle in our day-to-day -day life, in our movement, in our community, in our politics. How we concretely translate the general principle of self-government, of social solidarity, how we translate it into concrete projects. I think today this is the challenge. And it's never been as crucial, you know, as after the lesson that we have learned, you know, in facing this pandemic. Now the vaccine, the vaccine is like God now. <laughs> the vaccine will solve everything. If you only had the vaccine, I'm not speaking against the vaccine. I'm simply saying that's not the solution. The solution to the COVID pandemic will not be done because there will be another, another epidemic. If the causes are not dealt with, COVID will only be the first. We have seen Africa, there was meningitis, cholera, Ebola, Zivka, one epidemic after the other, who says that COVID will be the last, will go from vaccine to vaccine. Unless the underlying structure, the destruction of the land commons, the destruction of the social commons are dealt with. Thank you. The, uh, I could see that uh, Agnieszka Mruz right, uh, raised her hand uh, a few minutes ago. So, Agnieszka. Yes. Um, hello, Agnieszka. Okay. Good evening. Uh, it's really Good great evening. to see you in shape. And um, I want to ask you a very practical question because in your books, you always focus the role of struggle and you did follow what's happening in Poland in 2016 yeah. with the women's yeah. movement and maybe you I'm, I'm sure you're aware we had another amazing yes. movement uh, but we kind of losing this battle for the basic reproduction uh, rights um, there is a, we constantly um, feel and attacks on the uh, rights to on abortion I would like ask you for advice for the movement because mm -hmm. there were the movement was massive, popular with women coming to streets, really fighting 
for many weeks. Um, so I would like, because you, get, you gave a lot of examples from Latin America with the with movements that won, but we have a feeling now that we, um, we kind of losing on this basic rights, a uh, basic fight struggle for reproduction uh, rights. Yeah. I really want to know your, your yeah. advice for us, what to do in Poland in 2021. Yeah. You know, I'm not there and I always feel like, but I want to say this. I want to say this because the question, the struggle that women are making in Poland is a, is a struggle that we are facing here. And then the women in Argentina, you know, we now have two successful examples of struggles, you know, over the issue of abortion in countries that uh, face terrible obstacles because for instance, in uh, Ireland, right, one successful case, you know, the dominance of this very reactionary Catholic church was absolute. And over the years, the women have been able to create a situation of change, of reversing it, right? Recently in Argentina, as you know, the struggle has gone on for a long, long time, had many, many cycles. And finally, they were able to obtain the right to abortion. Of course, now they will have another struggle to implement it because once you have it on papers, right? But even to have the votes, given the kind of, of campaign the Pope Francisco made was absolutely important. So first thing that I want to say to you is don't give up. It, it, the struggle has a long, many phases, as many setbacks, but doesn't mean the people go home. No, the reality is learn from what needs to be done next. And here I want to bring the experience of the United States. We have learned that is very important in the struggle for abortion. You know, we have abortion legally, but you know, now it has been very, very much eroded. And uh, we know that is in danger, but we have learned, and this is one of the things that I've been insisting upon. It's important to gain to the struggle. Also a lot of women who seem to be against abortion. Um, by stressing that the struggle for choice, for control of our bodies is a struggle that is for the right to have children if we want and not to have them if we don't want. In other words, it's not only a struggle for abortion, but it's a struggle to be able to decide over our reproductive capacity. Right? And I think not to separate the issue of resources, the issue of children, right? And the issue of, no, we, have, we don't want to. It's a class issue, it's a, it's a question of labor, it's a question of resources, it's a question of women's energy and time, of women's health. It's not just a question of freedom in the abstract, right? But I think, that to make the struggle, right, a struggle that touches also, that speaks to women who may not be, you know, dealing with the issue of abortion, but are dealing with the issue of denied maternity, of the challenge of being able to be mother in situation in which they do not have any resources. And therefore they see perhaps the concentration on abortion as a threat. You know, for us, it was a major mistake in the 1970s, late 70s and 80s. For example, it created a rift between black women and white women. Black women in the United States have always been denied maternity. You know, under slavery, their children were sold. Uh, under slavery, they were raped to be forced to produce children because in Virginia, for instance, 
the master, the white uh, owners of the plantation wanted to be able to produce slaves in the locality instead of importing them from Africa. Um, black women have been sterilized, you know, and they've been literally punished, you know, accused of having too many children. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So I think we need to speak to a struggle for abortion that also brings the question of social justice, of access to resources, and I think it will gain to the struggle. You know, women who now may not be supportive, mm -hmm. and also keep in mind, you know, what you have achieved in this big demonstration was fantastic. Obviously, you cannot sustain the level of mobilization, but that's not a defeat. That is not a defeat. The movement recedes, learns from what was done, and then you prepare for the next. It shouldn't be seen as a defeat. Obviously, those moments of mobilization, that was miraculous. They are very real, they are very important, they are very powerful. It's a statement that has affected the whole society, even if it does not gain. It has placed women as a key social force in Poland. And everybody has seen across the world. It was, it was broadcast in the, in the news in New York. In Latin America and in Ireland, everybody has reached the world that struggle. That's an amazing achievement, but you cannot sustain it. So the struggle is how to organize those moments when you have a great high and then everything else feels like, oh, we didn't, we didn't break through and therefore there is the modernization. No, it shouldn't be the modernization. It should be, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Look in Argentina, how many times they've gone in the street? How many years they've gone in the street? In the end, they created a mass force that could, that could not be, that went out not only for abortion, went out against the issue of debt, you know, went out against all kinds of issues, right? So I would say, uh, no reason for this, for being discarded. Uh, thank you. We have a, we have uh, we have a lot of questions. Most of them are on chat, and I think that uh, the next one is from Katarzyna Hertz, and the question goes as follows: How can we create slash approach? the enchantment process when there is a discrepancy between languages that we use to talk about nature. I mean, how to create the commons of the language that doesn't objectify nature? That's a very, also very good question. Yeah, very interesting, very important. The question of language is very, 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 very important. I think uh, we have to put that on the agenda. You know, the, the language, it's a terrain of struggle. So my answer is you're right. We need to find the language. We need to find the language that is not objectifying, that is not alienating, that is not the language of the market. But you know, we can we can be inventive, we can be creative. You know, um, the feminist movement has produced a tremendous amount of creativity of poetry, you know? So I'm sure, for instance, that the mobilization that we have seen with women going out in the street for abortion is already producing new languages, is already producing new imaginary. So I would say, yes, we need words. We need new words, we need new songs, we need new images. Uh, that's very, very important. And for me, the issue of language is crucial because I'm an old woman, as you can see. And I grew up and I became, I started doing political work 
in the student movement of the 70s, 60s and 70s, you know, and I know the experience. I went through the experience of being in a room with a lot of women and only the men were speaking. Only the men were on the stage and, and we were there mostly silent. Maybe once in a while we had the courage to ask a question. Often we didn't have the courage to even ask what they meant. Later on, for instance, I discovered that what they had to say was not so profound. But often it was difficult to understand what they were talking about because they didn't try to explain the meaning of some words because they were speaking a language that excluded, you know, they had read Marx and we hadn't read Marx, they had read Bakuni, what have you. So one of the struggles I've made in my work, and I hope I have succeeded, is to be clear, to, which doesn't mean that you trivialize or that you minimize. It means that you make the effort to explain by giving that extra sentence, by giving that extra explanation. So to me, the democratization of language is fundamental for the feminist movement. When I read the feminist piece and I don't understand it, or is written in a language that only the 5% can understand, then I say, this is useless. This is useless. Even if you deal with big theoretical issues, you can do it, I know, in a way that can be clear. Because the big theoretical issue, either they have something to do with people's lives, and then you build the connection. Or if they don't, then they're not worth. If they don't have a connect, but if they have a connection with people's lives, then you can make the connection in your language. So language is crucial. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Yeah, and to those people who haven't read uh, Sylvia's works, I have to encourage them because what strikes me when I was reading them, that they are really clear that with all those complicated questions that they raise, they're beautifully written and they they really clear and you've used the language that uh, that is uh, possible to understand for everyone. Yeah, so, I swore to myself, I never wanted with my words to create a sense of humiliation that we yes, suffered, yes, yes. that our generation suffered when we yes, were in it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, the question from uh, from Giselle. Uh, um, thank you very much for the inspiring and hopeful words. Uh, I was wondering if you had any vision or ideas for extending and applying your idea of the commons to a world I assume many of us are daily a part of, academia. At the moment, it seems like the trend is more towards competition, selection, and isolation. Yeah, I think we have to fight that. I know it's getting worse and worse and worse. We speak of enclosure of knowledge. You know, one of the effort I made in my work is being to say we have to expand the notion of the commons and the notion of enclosure beyond Marx, not only land, not only, but uh, enclosure of the body, right? The denial of, uh, you know, abortion, contraception is enclosure of the body enclosure of knowledge, the privatization of knowledge, putting a fee you know, on education, forcing students to engage into a big, big debt eh? and uh, in order to be able to go to university. You know, in the United States now, students are leaving the university with a debt of $40,000, $50,000. All their life is mortgaged. All their life is mortgaged. It's a disciplinary instrument. It's an exploitative, you know, a profit-making, but also disciplinary instrument to force you to go into that so that you don't have time to go to a political meeting. You have to work, 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 work to pay for your classes, right? So I think that we speak of commons of knowledge deprivatize knowledge. 
we people are building now free universities, right? Building structure in which we produce knowledge collectively. You know, I think this can, and you can do that within the university. You know, I, for many years, I work with other people on this project. We had, uh, we set up an organization that was looking in particular at the situation of student struggle in Africa. And uh, we call it the Committee for Academic Freedom. The concept of academic freedom is it's a traditional conservative camp, but we use it provocatively. We use it to say academic freedom is the right to study without, you know, enclosure, to write to study without having to pay for it, to go into debt for it, the right to be a producer of knowledge, to have access to knowledge and time, et cetera, et cetera. So I think within the university, within the university, you know, using the time for classes with students, um, that I think is extremely important, you know? So, you don't have to, I think, only leave the university. And I think there is an, a struggle going on within the institution. Because after all, the universities are public wealth. That means they have been built, you know, with the effort, the energy of a lot of people, of a lot of working class people. So we should start saying, the university is, is ours, right? So that's that's the the change. It's not a favor that we enter the university. We have to reclaim the university as something that has been produced, right? By people's work, by people's monies, by people's energies. Hmm. Um, thank you. I could see a uh, raising hand of Antonina Janushkevich. Antonina, can you, could you, not, could you ask your question now? Yes, oh, you're there. Ah, uh, Nina, I see now. Oh, I see now the chat. Oh, I now see you. Antonina, mm -hmm. you've already written this. Uh -huh. could, ah, hello? Okay, so I have a question. I think yeah, it's yeah. Nina. I have a question about Utopia. Is that? So well, there are two Nina's, uh, two Nina's apparently, and the other raised simply a hand, which meant that she wanted to ask herself a question. But okay, we can wait for that and you can read Sylvia now okay. the question so, from Nina. Yeah, uh, then, so the, the question of Utopia. Um, there's been a lot of debate, as you know, Marx was against utopia because utopia meant, uh, you know, a place nowhere, right? And, uh, you know, it came with attempts to create revolution now. You no, know? I think over time, the attitudes by social movement, the approach to utopia has become more positive, right? Uh, there is a, a very well-known uh, activist in the United States called Chris Carlson. Yeah, he speaks of nowtopia, nowtopia, not utopia, <laughs> in the sense that much of what used to be seen as utopia can begin to be realized now. The commune, cooperative forms of living, right? They're not the solution. Right? But they are all moments, they are all projects that can help to create more solidarity. I think the issue of utopia is when, you know, these solutions are seen as permanent the, or these projects are seen as the solution rather than as part of a process, right? So, for example, the communal system, right? Uh, if it is seen as part of a process, not as the end point. Mm -hmm. So that I think is uh, a, a response to utopia, right? A communal garden, that's not utopia, but it's, uh, 
the principle of the commons applied to the present, but with the, within a process of social transformation, not as an end point. Yeah. Then there is a question here. Yeah, about but the... Antonina, Antonina, the other Antonina yes. uh, is back. Antonina, you okay. okay. Hello. Hello. Yes. Antonina. Hello. Yes. Okay, you can ask your question now. Is this only me who cannot hear you? I, I cannot hear you. Okay, let's 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 wait then, and um, let me see. Okay, there's there's a question from Angelina Kuse. Mm -hmm. uh, Sylvia, can you say this is is um, it was earlier? It was asked earlier, and um, the resurgence of servitude. Silvia, what do you think about the global municipalist movement, the ah. Curious Cities Network, the international network of cities governed by citizen platforms like in Barcelona, and their role in reinforcing the principle of the commons? Of course, they achieved a lot, lots of commons in Italy, remunicipalization of energy in Barcelona, for example, and so on and so on. Do you have any critical comments on their approach, process, whatever, or recommendation for this movement to improve or radicalize more yeah well you know i must say that i'm not as familiar as municipalism as i probably should be but it seems to me that uh, if we the participation of institution is probably the best form of participation institution because municipalism means usually the very local the very local government, something on which people can have a more direct knowledge, more direct intervention, and therefore it's a, a less alienating relationship to power, to institutional power, right? And can have some, I, I am not, um, I don't believe in the state, but uh, I'm also not you know, dogmatic on these issues. And so if under certain conditions, for example, entering or being part of the local municipality is, uh, can, be, can be achieved. I know in Barcelona, for instance, that uh, it was very important that for instance, they were able to have some uh, intervention in relation to housing you know, to structuring of neighborhood. And at the same time, they also encounter some really basic obstacles because uh, you, know, you have the power of this corporation, you know, who control now the real estate industry. And, uh, you know, often a municipal government does not have the power to change that. And so I also know that there are limits to what can be achieved through that structure. And it seems to me the municipalism does not replace or um, exempt the need to have the kind of common in, in the communities that I was referring to. And in fact, needs that common, needs that kind of work in the community in order to be able even not to be swallowed by the great global powers, the great corporate power that today operate in every part of, in every part of the world, right? So when you enter any institutional terrain, it's full of minds. <laughs> it's a very mind terrain. You have to be very careful so that the logic does not reshape you, right? And that uh, you are able to enter it, maintaining a certain autonomy, you know? And uh, I would like to know more about how people have done that and what we have learned in the process. Uh, 
Okay, so I think we can move on to the next question, uh, which is from Zero Bakiewicz. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Because we are still struggling to secure basic reproductive rights in Poland for women, I am wondering why do you think it was essential to the government in Poland after the fall of Soviet Union to delegalize the right and access to abortion against the will of the people? Ah. Then I think uh, it's a question that uh, you probably can answer better than I, because, you know, there has been, there has been a, across the world, this uh, big uh, um, wave of, um, you know, mobilization by religious institution, right? A big wave of mobilization. I think it's important to see that when we speak of abortion, we're speaking of something larger than just giving birth. And uh, one aspect of the abortion issue, you know, traditionally had to do with the labor market. You know, after all, there's a direct connection between women's reproductive capacity, what happens with their reproductive, and the movements of the labor market. You know, at the end of World War II, you know, the goal went on the radio and told French women, produce 12 million babies, right? Many have died in the war. Now you go home and produce 12 million babies, right? So there's a direct connection between, you know, abortion, women's reproductive capacity and labor power. But there's also something else. There's also something else which is important. Of course, today, the question of racism, you know, uh, there are many uh, government who want white women to reproduce, right? They want, uh, and conservative movements who want, uh, yeah, so this is another angle. But there's also the question of disciplining women. Uh, disciplining women's body, reproductive capacity is depressing women's sexuality is dealing with relation between women and men, right? To this day, women are still primarily responsible for the care of children, even when men are helping, sharing the work, women still have the primary responsibility. I mean, I see it every day. <laughs> you go out, it's these women with the children, is the organization of work, you know, still pushes women, and now with COVID, imagine women going back to, to the home. Uh, so there is a question of disciplining women. Now, which of these factors are the most prominent, you know, in the decision of the Polish government, right? And you know, religion, religion has to do with the, I always saw religion as an instrument to discipline everyday reproduction. The priest traditionally, especially in Catholic countries with the confession and everything else is the one who has more direct access to the discipline of women. You know, sexuality, you know, is the priest who wants to know whether you, you did something, you know, sexually transgressive. Right, so the, the church has been a major instrument for the disciplining and controlling of women's reproduction, you know, from abortion to sexuality, et cetera, et cetera. So I think you have to, to look at uh, the conditions, but you know better than me what um, has prompted the Polish government into this direction. But I would say that there is an international trend, you know, and the dominance of Pentecostal, um, also Catholic organization intervening as political organization, right? And the pressuring government mm, to introduce stricter forms of discipline, particularly with regard to women's body and women's life. This is a global phenomenon. 
Uh, yeah, okay. Antonina had a problem with her speakers. Antonina, now are you are you with us? Yes. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Right. <laughs> ah, good. Uh, so, oh. <laughs> so good evening. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for your very powerful speech uh, as well for us for your all uh, theoretical work. Um, my question concerns your views on the surrogacy uh, you have presented in your late, last book. Uh, well, uh, I somehow understand your very critical standpoint, and so it's kind of a provocative question. Yeah. Uh, what is not clear for me from the theoretical point is um, what distinguishes surrogacy from prostitution? Well, you write oh. in Beyond the Periphery of the Skin, uh, it's a quote, uh, for a while the prostitutes uh, sells to others a service and the temporary use of her body the surrogate gives to other in exchange for money complete control over her life and a child of a child. Well, to my mind, it's somehow unconvincing, uh, especially after you have re revealed the discourses around women, dedication, etc., and uh, for example, wages against the housework. Uh, so for me, it looks as like if you were somehow romanticized pregnancy. Well, I'm not a techno optimist, but uh, but so it is a provocative question. But maybe we could think another uh, surrogacy, uh, surrogacy that could overthrow the concept of uh, of nuclear family, as uh, for example Sophie Louis uh, claims. So I'm very curious. Uh, what do you think about it? Yeah, no, I think there's a big difference. The difference is the child. You know what I mean? Prostitution is a form of exploitation. You sell your body the same way you go into a factory. It's a different way of selling your body, your labor power, prostitution. In the case of surrogacy, there is a child. You're selling another person. That is, I think, makes an important difference. So it's a very dangerous step because the, when we legalize the right that people have to sell other persons, you know, basically by surrogacy from 10,000 to 15,000, et cetera, et cetera. But what it is, you're producing a human being to sell it. You're producing a human being with a specific purpose, not for the well being of that person, because in the end, you will have no responsibility for the child. It's a institutionalizing the lack of responsibility for each other, beginning with your own child. It's something that's so, such an abomination that a person, a woman, produces another human being to be sold. I, I think that's the big difference. That is the big difference. One thing is to sell your labor power. The other is to sell another person. And in this case, there is a transaction, a marketable transaction, whereby you receive a certain amount of money and you transfer this person under the power of people. You don't know who they are. You don't know what will happen to their child. You will have no responsibility. You know, there are feminists who are criticizing men for giving sperm to the banks because giving the sperm in a way is saying, I don't take responsibility for how it will be used for the child that will be born. Well, what about producing a child that is going to be marketed? And that, I think, is the difference. There's an element of slavery there that I, I think we have to reject. OK, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm really sorry because I omitted one of the questions asked earlier by Ronit Lentin. And I'm really sorry for that, Ronit. I don't know if you're still with us, but now I can, I'm going to read it, um, read it out. You have mentioned the intersection of gender and class, but you have not mentioned race. What about the silencing of majority world feminists by white and Western feminisms? I thought I did mention race. I thought I, my God, yes. What, what, uh, what is the question specifically? Why, what, 
No, if you mention that there's uh, there is no question. I, I guess. know the, the obviously I think uh, is very important. I mentioned very beginning that we don't have also one feminism. You know, for instance, since I mentioned over and over and over that uh, the question, for instance, of reproduction, you know, and abortion has been, uh, you know, an, an issue in which black and white women have taken different roads in the United States. The reproductive justice movement was a movement, and I mentioned that primarily of black women, that, which shows that even among feminists and women, there is not one universal viewpoint, of course. No, they, we cannot speak also women in general. And so more and more we've been speaking of black women, immigrant women, etc. And uh, in the case of uh, you know, black women, I mentioned that you know, they oppose the idea of equating abortion with choice because of the history of slavery and denied maternity. You know, women being forced, raped, to be forced to produce children in slavery to be put on the option. You know, sometimes there were women who used herbs to kill the child, to abort, because they did not want to have children that would become slaves, right? And uh, so they always insisted, the reproductive justice movement that was born in the 1980s by black women was born to say the issue of abortion has to be broadened to bring in the right for women to have the children they want and not at the cost of their lives, to have the resources. So the issue of the body, abortion has to be connected with the question of economic resources, access to resources, yeah. So it's a very important issue. And, um, and of course, it's beyond procreation because it yeah. affects the question of work. For instance, to, you know, intersectionality, right? Um, there's been a whole uh, criticism or by black feminists like bell hooks on, on the feminist critique of the family. Mm -hmm. There is a piece that I quote in Revolution at Point Zero called Home Place as a Site of Resistance. That when I read it, it made a big impression on me. I was very moved, profoundly moved. And it's a piece that says that is emblematic, very emblematic of intersectionality. And it's a piece that says the black the feminist have criticized the family, have seen liberation as going out of the family, smash monogamy, smash the nuclear family. For black women it's been very different because the black family has been often the only place where they felt loved and valued. Where going out of the family, the outside of the family was the place of danger was the white neighborhood, was the place of danger. And coming home, home was a place of resignification, of revaluation. It's a powerful, powerful piece. Um, but yeah, that uh, there is not a universal, uniform, homogenizing viewpoint. We have to stay away, even within feminism, from any homogenizing viewpoint. Okay, so uh, I will move on to the next question from Angelina Kuse. We are facing the resurgence of servitude also in Europe, leaving domestic reproductive workers from Latin America and Eastern Europe, also Poland, working in Western European countries, mm -hmm. seem, to be a new, seem to be new servants at the disposition of their superiors almost 24 hours a day, often working informally, they are a great example of what you call the pure labor, po labor power with no guarantees, easy to move on, move from place to place. What do you think should be done with it? How to approach an effective struggle on this topic? All right, two things. First of all, one, 
is uh, the feminist movement should give complete support to the struggle of you know uh, immigrant women domestic worker more than they've done so far. I don't think the feminist movement is mobilized enough. Number one, right? And I think uh, to be fight against all the discriminating, right? Uh, look, there was a whole effort by the European state, the European community, the Vatican, right? To ensure that as women in Europe enter the wage workforce, there'll be a flow of women coming from the Philippines, the Caribbean island, Latin America, Africa, Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe, for example, in Italy, huge amount of Eastern Europe women. So the demise of socialism has provided a huge amount of domestic workers as well as sex workers, right? So this was very much programmed part of the new international division of labor that has come into place, you know, in the 80s and 90s, you know. So a large number of women in Europe go to wage work in the service sector, you know, they move out to the home and then you have, you know, these women who come in from countries that have been impoverished, that have been structurally adjusted, totally recolonized, right? So first of all, I think the feminist movement in any country has to fight against this, has to fight against all the restrictive laws, right? Because there are laws that are ensuring that when these women come, right? They come in situation of servitude. Hmm? And so we have to fight, we have to join in a common fight. So I'm looking for, I wrote a piece on this called uh, We Have Seen Other Countries, We Have Other Culture. And it's, a, it's, a, it's about the relationship between the feminist movement and the migrant domestic workers. And I can send it to you, I can send you the PDF. But the second point is that now, Migrant women are organizing. They have been organizing and we have powerful movement. I mean, I don't know about Poland, but in Spain, they are very powerful movement. In the United States, they are very powerful. The migrant domestic workers movement. In Spain, for instance, Territorio Domestico Activo, Rafaela Pimentel and many other women, are, they have been fantastic. They have been an inspiration to the feminist movement. They are the one who have brought back to the feminist movement, the question of reproduction. They are the one who said, without us, nothing moves. Without us, nothing moves, right? Reproduction is the center, you know? The work that we do is the base of society. So they have brought back very old feminist issues, the whole importance of reproduction, reproductive work, that no other activity could take place without women producing all this work, okay? So I would say today we are in a new world where domestic workers are not only victim, but they are actually struggling and they are now inspiring the women's movement. <laughs> they are now bringing new issues because what is beginning to happen and we see it in the United States is that we have a domestic, a feminist movement by immigrant domestic workers who are speaking of domestic work, reproduction, sexuality, but also combining it with the question of race, coloniality, anti-colonial struggle. Many come from countries that have been colonized, right? For example, the Philippines, Latin America. So then now it's a feminism that places the issue of reproduction, also showing the connection with the issue of race, 
of coloniality uh, and, and in a sense broadens the horizon. And I think it's very important. So I would suggest that, um, you know, look at the struggle that women are making and the feminist movement should join the struggle and fight against all the state legislation that are putting restriction because they are affecting not only immigrant women, they are affecting all of us. Thank you. Uh, there's, there's a question from Maria Markievicz. Uh, thank you so much, Silvia, for your wonderful talk. I have a question about your views on domestic violence. In one of your lectures, you said that nowadays violence against women becomes more and more extreme and more visible. I yeah. found it very interesting, especially now when women are forced to stay at home and domestic violence is on the rise. <clears throat> Could you elaborate on that extremity and visibility a bit more? Yeah, right. Yeah, because we have them, you know, and first of all, with COVID, we know that on average in all across the world, domestic violence has increased 40%. But what we have begun to see over the last 30, 40 years is not only a major increase in domestic violence, you know, due to all the tensions in the family, that impoverishment, that there's a whole chapter, a big chapter in the book of violence about the significance of the debt economy. The fact that people, more and more people are full of debt. That life now goes on with the credit card and the debt are piling and particularly women you know, who have very little money. And in the United States, you know, women who have wage work, they use the wage to borrow money because the wages are so low that they cannot live on them. And the more that they have, according to statistics, the more violence because the debt brings a whole tension in the family. But aside from this, we have seen, and, and of course, women are struggling today. They don't accept you know, to be subordinate to men. And that the male wage is collapsing. You know, there used to be a system where, okay, the man brought the wage home, the woman gave services, and the man paid the bill of the home. Terrible system, dependence. But when that system breaks down, when that system breaks down, because work is precarious, unemployment grows, the male wage collapses. So the crisis, you know, um, an Argentinian feminist has written the we are living the crisis of the patriarchy of the wage. You know, I always write about the patriarchy of the wage. We are living the crisis of the patriarchy of the wage. You know, as men do not have access, as in the past, to secure wages, violence replaces the wage. What they could obtain in the past because they had economic money economic power today you know increases in the absence of that violence this is one part of the story but there is also another part of the story which is that the increase of public violence right of two types you know the violence the women encounter because now they are more and more in the public space and in ways that makes them very vulnerable. Women now, for example, in many countries spend days in the streets, selling things, working in the street, in the market and so on. And so they are confronting the violence of the police, the violence of many men who are also working, right? Women are migrants. You know, there's been an enormous increase in the number of women who are migrants. 
And migration is a violent process. You know, I've written that, uh, which is true, that women who migrate from Latin America to the United States, before leaving, they take contraceptive if they have them, because they know they are going to be raped or they fear they are going to be raped. So the crisis of employment, the crisis the neoliberalism has created, forcing people, forcing women to go to places, to take all kinds of risks that before they did not, right, has increased the situation of violence. Also, you know, uh, we have seen that violence has been a response to women organizing. At the border with Mexico, where you have a lot of sweatshop, the maquila system, these are sweatshop, these are industrial plantation, you know, where people who work there, mostly women, have no rights. A lot of those women have been killed. Every time they try to organize, we have seen women disappearing. And we have seen their bodies are left into public spaces, right? So not only there is an increase in assaults and violence, which clearly connected with the fact that wherever they are, Women are struggling, they are going to new places, they are refusing exploitation and they are struggling. And the violence is a means of disciplining, eh? but it's taking even more brutal forms. You know, in the case of the maquilas at the, at the border with Mexico, for example, uh, when women are killed, the bodies are left in the public sphere, in open space as a means of terrorizing other women, right? Often they are mutilated, you know? So there is, um, there is a feminist, a Argentinian-Brazilian feminist, Rita Segato. She speaks of pedagogical cruelty, that today women are victims to pedagogical cruelty. Pedagogical cruelty is because the cruelty is organized in a way they want to teach women to fear. And that's the body making the violence visible. You don't hide the body. You leave it in public space. You mark it so that it inspires more terror, more fear, right? And we have a lot of uh, uh, disappearances and murders of women in the rural area the Amazonia and other places, Colombia, because women are defending the community. You know, I mentioned the women are the ones who are defending the commons, right? They are the ones who are in the forefront against uh, fracking, against uh, deforestation, against uh, when a mining company comes into an area like a gold mine, a gold mine, uses arsenic to purify the gold. Arsenic goes into the waterways, poison people. This is the water that people use to drink. And so women, of course, they are in, in charge of reproduction. They have to cook. They have to deal with people when they get sick. So women have been very, very active you know, in the defense of the commons, in the defense of forests, of waters, fisheries. And uh, we have seen a tremendous increase in the, you know, the, the violence against women has also been a response to their struggle to defend the commons. And also I want to mention here the work of uh, the, you know, this French feminist activist, sociologist, Jules Falquet. I mentioned her in my work. She has written a powerful, lots of powerful things, but uh, showing also how the increasing militarization of everyday life, right, with neoliberalism, with dispossession, comes an increasing 
militarization of life so that you have soldiers, bodyguard, security guard, guard in front of a bank, every place there is a guard. And uh, the expansion of incarceration. With that, you have more violence. You know, there is a the celebration of an aggressive type of masculinity, the guy with the gun, the guy with, and you know, and of course, so, uh, the movies, right, these monsters who have all this armament, except there is a celebration of a very aggressive type of masculinity, you know, that comes with the, in, the fact that many, many, for many men going into the army, becoming a narco trafficker, becoming a bodyguard is now, you know, one of the easiest jobs to get. And you cannot separate violence. If all day you're violent, when you go home, you beat your wife, you attack your children, et cetera, et cetera. So that is another factor. This, this society is becoming the, the, the everyday life, more surveillance and more violence. This is something that we have to organize against. Thank you, Silvia. Um, you answered a lot of questions and uh, there's one more from, uh, uh, from uh, a Facebook chat, but I think it's uh, addressed more to all people who to more to participants of the seminar. And I guess it's more like a call for a discussion group about uh, politics of uh, the commons in Warsaw. Um, and um, yeah, it would be good to establish one mm -hmm. um, because Warsaw is a city that uh, white privatization had terrible consequences in recent years. So yes, I think it's a good good idea. Mm -hmm. But now I think we can uh, we can finish our meeting. Thank you so much for such an inspiring you. lecture and uh, and all the, the all the answers to all the questions. And I'd like to thank you, thank uh, all the participants of our seminars for for very very interesting questions. And I hope that uh, you will also join us for the next seminar uh, in uh, our cycles. You can, you can uh, check it on the site of Biennale Warszawa. But right now I'm going to say goodbye to everyone and wish uh, good night. Thank you so much. <laughs>